There was a day break, so I have to remind you what we did last time. We were discussing invertibility of symmetric matrices. So let A and N by N. Such that it is symmetric and the entries are centered of variance one. They are independent, uh, actually, IID up to a symmetry restriction and also that the entries are have light tails formally they are sub gaussian but if uh, you are not familiar with this term uh, you can assume that they are bounded and then general theorem that for any epsilon positive the probability that the smallest singular value of a is bounded by epsilon over square root of n is less or equal than c uh, epsilon to the power alpha plus exponential of negative n to the power c. And uh, what we proved last time was a theorem of Vershinian. Which, uh, which proves the statement with alpha being one eighth and uh, C some absolute constant between zero and one. The optimal bound should be at alpha equals one and C equals one. And this bound was established very recently, actually well, this year by Campos Jensen Marcus and uh, Sastra Buddha and C equals one. And this is universal in a, in a sense that it applies to all such random matrices without uh, restriction, uh, further restrictions on entries. And also this is optimal and it shows that if Again, if we ignore the additive term, alpha equals one, this is the behavior of the Gaussian symmetric matrix. And exponential of negative, say, C prime N is the behavior of Bernoulli random matrix. The probability that two rows are equal is two to the negative N. So this is optimal and it shows that for a general matrix, we have only two different types of behavior. To pass from Vershinian's theorem to this optimal bound, we need to improve two parameters and both are very non-trivial and these two are two separate routes. So I'm going to discuss uh, removing this C and probably I will not have time to discuss improving alpha, but improving C, if you plug in epsilon equals zero means that you would prove that a random symmetric matrix in particular a random Bernoulli symmetric matrix is uh, uh, singular with at most exponentially small probability in F. This is already a great result. And I'm not going to go over Vershinian's proof again, but uh, let me uh, say one word about where it misses the optimal constant. If you Remember, we wrote A 
we separated one block of it, A11, one, one, say, B transposed and analyzed these two independent family of random variables, X and B are independent. And the only source of uh, uh, this constant was the arithmetic nature of some bad se uh, set. So we have a bad set M in Rn. This is the set of points which have arithmetic structure. And this arithmetic structure was identified at the very first lecture. Uh, this is the points which are pretty close to the points of the integer lattice. It's a small union of small balls around the integer lattice. And uh, I don't have to take the whole integer lattice. I, I need to take only a ball of radius one over epsilon. So what epsilon we are talking about here, uh, of course, for invertibility, we would like to put epsilon equals zero, but uh, this picture would not make sense for epsilon equals zero. And instead we are going to consider epsilon, which is exponential of negative CM. It would not matter because this term will be of the same order as this one. Okay, so how many points we have in this bad, how many balls do we have in this bad set? Uh, the radius is exponential in N. The dimension of the space is uh, N. So we ha have E to the CN to the power N, E to the N squared. We have a huge number of the, these points. And now, uh, to, to get the optimal estimate, as we saw, we need to show that for any fixed vector y in Rn, the probability of that y belongs to b m is exponentially small. As soon as uh, we do it, we, uh, uh, we can follow Vershinian's proof and get the exponential bound on, on probability. So how do one get this? m is the union of the balls. So I'll take uh, the center of one ball. So let's say that this is point Z. If I prove that uh, the probability that the distance between B, Z, and y is small. Uh, this means that with high probability, the center of the ball falls far away from the point y. But uh, the ball, uh, the ball around z has a small radius, so if the center is far from the from y, then the whole ball will be far from y. So if I can do it for uh, all uh, balls and uh, for uh, any center, get a uniform bound on this probability, uh, then I would use the union bound over the, uh, the centers and just multiply this probability by the number of balls, I'll get the estimate. So, yes. 
yes, uh, exponential in n squared. This is the thing which makes the whole uh, the whole story different, uh, difficult. But we already encountered this exponential in n squared in the I, full, fully IID case. How did we proceed there? So if we take one such point Z, uh, the probability that uh, the norm of B, so I'll assume for a moment that the i j r i i b so it's not as uh, assume for a moment that it's not a symmetric matrix but an iid matrix then we have a, a small uh, ball probability uh, the probability uh, that norm b z minus y is less than actually here t square root of n is less or equal than c t to the power n plus the exponentially small term. No, or uh, sorry, not plus, or t greater or equal than epsilon. Very well, and our epsilon is exponentially small. So this would not be a problem. It's exponential to then again uh, to then. Now, what is the source of this n? The reason that we have such high power is that the number of uh, rows of B is n. I'm cheating a little, it's n minus one, but it doesn't matter. So the number of rows of B is N and this number of rows appears as the power. And the key uh, point in this estimate is the row, that the rows of B are independent. Well, what happened? Yes. Uh, hidden here. Uh, no, uh, no, no, the, for, uh, for each, no, 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 you are mixing two things. If, uh, if I look at one row, the additive term is exponential to them. And then I uh, consider the whole matrix, it gets raised to the power N. Yes, it's exponential in N square and we are fine if B were, fully IID. That's how it worked in the fully IID case. Well, what, uh, what to do if uh, the matrix B is symmetric? What Vershinin did he used the same idea of uh, fully IID, but he has to get this fully IID from somewhere. So he cut out a rectangular block. And the entries of this block are fully IID. So you can do the same, but if you cut the block, D by D, 
then instead of n, you have n minus b. You have a deficiency and that the arithmetic structure is the same. So you, can, uh, you cannot get uh, to the exponentially small, uh, to the ex exponential level unless d is very small. And this was this problem. The drop in the power was uh, the problem which uh, limited Vershinin's approach. Later, uh, the, uh, the group campus at, uh, uh, at all and uh, uh, independently, Jane Savasoni tried to improve on this uh, taking different rectangular blocks and the ideal situation was considering uh, the whole lower uh, triangle, so, so to say, but this, uh, this approach led only to the power n to the one half. To get the power uh, to that, uh, to get exponential in N, you need somehow to use the whole matrix B. And uh, uh, pretend that this is a fully ID matrix. And the way to do it was discovered by Campos. Uh, Jensen, uh, Michelin, and uh, Sastrabube. So what they did, instead of one rectangular block, they uh, considered D, which is a small proportion of N, and considered two blocks. This one is H and this one is of course H transposed. And uh, uh, then the probability, let me for, uh, for shortness assume that Y is zero. The probability that the norm of B Z is less than the epsilon square root of N is uh, less or equal than the probability that uh, if I write Z, as z, d, z, and minus d. The first, this is the vector of the first d coordinates. This is the vector of the last coordinates. So h, z, d is less than epsilon of n and h transpose z and minus d is less or equal than epsilon square root of n. Okay, now, uh, if H and H tra transpose were independent, we would just multiply these probabilities. This one will get us the number of columns of H is n minus d, so this would get us epsilon to the n minus d, this would get us epsilon to the d, and we will be done. Of course, the problem is that these two are not independent, h and h transposed is uh, are uh, the, the, the same ma matrix. So uh, first, 
No, you, uh, you have epsilon to the n minus d. Epsilon is exponent, uh, exponentially small, but you have to win over the union bound, which is epsilon to the n squared. You, you cannot lose. Uh, it's a constant multiple. And like in, uh, in the very first epsilon net argument, if you do it, you will miss the target by exponential, uh, by constant to the n. The whole fight here is uh, to prove that the probability is a constant to the n and the constant is smaller than one. See, so this cannot be lost. Uh, dropping this is what Vershinin did. And then uh, instead of epsilon to the n, he had to compromise by, uh, and get epsilon to the n. Yeah. n over 10 is, uh, uh, is very bad. He, he took d, which is almost n. And even that was uh, requiring this compromise. Actually, he took D to be N to the C, and this N to the C is what appeared there. Uh, so the, the, sm the larger D is, the worse result we get, of course, uh, if we consider only H, because uh, we have to raise it to the power n minus d. And so to save the day, we have to use this quantum. So how to use it? Well, if I take, again, if I take this alone, I get this. Uh, and I have to take the union bound over all centers of the ball. The idea of campus at all was that we don't have to take the union bound over all of them. We will recycle uh, Tikhomirov's idea. So we will combine it with Tihomirov's idea for, uh, for the fully IID case. Let's consider, let's assume that we can prove this for almost all centers. Then we'll take uh, the union over these almost all centers. And there will be a very small part of exceptional centers. But if it's, uh, this part is very small, we can treat it just considering only one rectangle. Well, uh, instead of counting the centers, following uh, Tihomirov's approach, we will take a random vector uniformly distributed over the centers. So, let Z capital, which is Z capital B, Z capital N minus T, T vector uniformly distributed over 
in the center. And then we have two sources of randomness are coming from, uh, if I replace Z, Z small by Z capital, we have two sources of randomness, one coming from H, another coming from Z. And this bound holds for all uh, ve uh, vectors uh, Z. Okay. Now let's look at the matrix H transposed. What can I say about it? This is a very fat matrix. Its uh, size is nine tenths n by uh, one tenth n by nine tenths n. This matrix is uh, fat, and according to Martian Kapastur law, the uh, their singular values, all their singular values are commensurate. This is more or less, this matrix acts more or less like a projection. Martian Kapastur law is asymptotic, but uh, uh, it can be formulated with explicit probability estimate. The probability that the smallest singular value of H transposed and the smallest singular value here is ST is greater than C square root of N is at least one minus C. Exponentially large. And this is an elementary inequality uh, since the number of rows and the number of columns differ so much. Uh, standard epsilon net argument will do it in half a page. Well, let's call this event typical. And then I'm going to estimate the probability with respect to Z and H of uh, uh, H Z D less than epsilon square root of N and H transposed Z N minus D is less than epsilon square root of N and this event is typical. Okay. Now let's write it by conditioning. This is the probability again with Z H of uh, H transpose Z N minus D less than epsilon root of N conditioned on norm H D uh, H Z D less than epsilon square root of N. <laughs> And E typical times the probability of the condition. E. Now let me. Uh, drop this e typical in the last term. It will be only greater, uh, less or equal if I erase this. And for this, I already have 
bound, uh, remember it. Uh, we already have this bound. It's T epsilon to the power N minus D. I want to get C epsilon to the D from this conditional probability. Uh, well, let's see on what we condition. This event depends on ZD and depends on the matrix H. If I take a random vector here, this is a cube, the coordinates are independent. So ZD and ZN minus D are independent. And if I condition on both H and ZD, uh, the, I can consider uh, all of them independent uh, uh, co constants. So now I have a constant matrix H and a random vector Z and minus D. So the argument for these two factors was the opposite. Here we condition on ZD and use the randomness of H. In the first term, we condition on H and use the randomness in ZD. Okay. Now let me uh, do a major uh, cheating. How, uh, how does this vector ZD how, uh, look like? It is uniformly uh, distributed in a D-dimensional qubits. The vector Z is uh, uniformly distributed in n-dimensional discrete cube. Its coordinates are uniformly distributed in d-dimensional discrete cube. Let's say that, imagine that this uh, distribution is not this uniform discrete distribution, but the Gaussian distribution. Just imagine it for a moment. Yes. Uh, ZD. Oh, yeah, 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 they are, they are projections onto the, the sphere, uh, yeah. I, I didn't want to add this in another layer. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, uh, imagine that these coordinates are Gaussian instead of being uniform discrete uh, over the lower dimensional discrete cube. What would we have here? We conditioned on H, H is constant and we conditioned on the event E typical. E typical means that the least singular value of H is as large as square root of M. And the image of uh, the Gaussian vector will have exactly the probability C epsilon to the D actually. Not uh, less or equal, but of order C epsilon to the D. This was the missing factor. Well, so in the ideal world, we will get it. The world is not ideal, our distribution is not. Gaussian, but uh, uniform over the discrete cube. And it's much more, uh, it resembles much more the uh, uniform distribution on the solid cube than the Gaussian distribution. So uh, actually, we can uh, uh, approximate it by a, a more or less uniform distribution on the cube just by convolving it with, uh, by adding 
a uniform distribution on the small cube. So we need to know, uh, and the uniform distribution on the solid cube has a bounded density. We, we need to know that if I act with the good matrix, the good means that the small singular value is large on a distribution with bounded density, I'll get this bound. So, for example, the, if the uh, probability that the projection, so uh, imagine that this H transposed is a projection uh, scaled by square root of N. If I can get the same uh, bound, or a, a distribution with bounded density, I'm done. It sounds like an elementary uh, fact. If you project a bounded density, you'll get a bounded density. And it should have been known for ages. Fortunately, the, uh, this fact is known, but uh, it was proved uh, less than 10 years ago. And the proof is uh, using quite a bit of Fourier analysis as well. But nevertheless, this is known. This is a known fact that uh, for any bounded density, we get this small ball probability with a lesser equal this time, but not approximately equal sign. And this is enough, as we said. We recovered, this is uh, uh, enough after another line. So uh, if we multiply it through, we get less or equal than C epsilon to the power M. Well, now let's look at, uh, at what we have. We have the probability of, with respect to two random variables, let me write it as the expectation with respect to Z of the probability with respect to H of whatever was here. Okay. Now I have the expectation with respect to my random vector of this probability. And if I use Markov's inequality, I'll write that the probability with respect to Z that the, the probability with respect to H of whatever we have here is uh, less than K to the power N of C epsilon to the power M is going to be less or equal than K to the negative N. K is whatever constant I, uh, I want to choose. How do I interpret it? Uh, the uh, will call the set of point Z for which this holds exceptional. And for this exceptional set, the cardinality will be K to the negative N times the cardinality of the whole set of centers. And K to the negative N is the exponential factor we, we were missing. So for these exceptional sets, uh, vectors, 
uh, instead of using the whole matrix H, H transpose, I'm going to use only this part and uh, K to the negative N will take care of the fact that this is enough. Yes, uh, sorry, uh, no. Uh, second. Yes, yes, uh, the, the, this, right. Sorry? The, yeah, the bad situation is that the small ball probability is large. Yes. Uh, K, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, we, uh, we use only this lower part and we see that we miss an exponential factor, the probability there from, if we, I take the union bound over the whole set of centers, we'll get a constant to the power n. To suppress this constant, I, I take k larger than this. Perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can ignore it. This mainly come. Uh, this condition is mainly on ZD. Well, and if we are not in this exceptional set, then the opposite inequality holds, and I have C epsilon to the power n, which I needed, and this would have uh, been the end of the proof. This is almost it, but unfortunately we have one caveat. Uh, the, so this is mainly the, the idea of the, of the proof. The only point where this scheme fails is that I took this E typical. And the probability of E typical is exponentially close to one, but uh, we are dealing with the union bound of a much larger set. This exponentially close is not going to be enough. Uh, the union, uh, union bound is over Z. Right. Oh. Right, right. This event is a uh, right. Uh, again, uh, uh, let's recall what uh, what do we need? We need this bound epsilon to the power n. Epsilon is exponentially small. We need e to the negative roughly n squared. And we have an exceptional event of probability e to the negative n. This is more than we can afford, although it's, uh, it's a very small probability, but 
here. We, uh, we cannot afford it. And then comes, uh, so uh, I am done with the principal idea and now how to handle the rest. What if E typical doesn't hold? Let's consider our typical events. Let E A the event that S B minus A plus one of A transpose is greater than c square root of n and s b minus k of h transposed is less than c square root of n. So e typical in, uh, in this terminology is e uh, well, let's say B minus K and B minus K minus one is E zero. So the other events are much less uh, probable than E typical. And one can show that the probability of, the, of E A for K greater than zero is what we have exponential to the negative C M and raise it to the power K. So then how to use it. We do the same calculation. So here uh, we use the same fact, but instead of D we'll have D minus K. And the main thing is the probability of uh, the second term, uh, factor in this term. Here I have to take intersection with the EK. If it were E typical, we had C epsilon to the power N minus D. And the, uh, the most technical part of the result is the following new decoupling theorem. That the probability that norm H D Z uh, sorry, H Z D is less or equal than epsilon square root of N and E A is roughly less or equal than the product of these probabilities. And this is Z. This time Z is no, uh, no longer random. I can take a deterministic vector 
So the randomness here is only with respect to H. And of course, the fact that H maps a certain vector into a small ball and the rank of H is essentially uh, the, the rank of uh, H or the rank of H transposed is essentially a D minus K are dependent, but they are very weakly dependent. And establishing the fact that this uh, very weak dependence doesn't affect the probability is requires quite a lot of work, but as soon as it is done, you have vastly decaying sequence of factors here. Remember that this probability was uh, small enough. And then we uh, just sum this up over K and I get that the, the sum of this over K is less or equal as we C epsilon to the power N. As soon as we have this, we are finished. So uh, the main idea of this proof was uh, to use the small ball technique and, uh, and H, a small ball probability technique and H for a fixed vector Z, D here. And for, uh, for one factor and uh, to fix H and use randomness with respect to Z for, the, for another factor. This combined yields exponential. And since I have one minute left, I'm not going to embark on, on, on proving it. Uh, alpha, thank you very much. So any questions?